So far, we've taken a look at two aspects of reliability, whether it's written early enough and whether it can be corroborated to determine if the Gospels are reliable. Let's do a third. Do we think these have been changed over time? If someone changes their story over time, there's a good reason to believe they're not telling you the truth. How do we know that the narrative, the Gospel narratives, haven't been changed over time? Uh, even if they were written early. Well, you have some early account, but how do I know that the account I have in my Bible today wasn't changed from the point at which it was written? Let me give you an analogy, a parallel of this. Let's say I have some piece of evidence that I find at a crime scene, and 30 years later, I bring it into trial, and I say, hey, you know what? Uh, this is what we discovered at the crime scene, and this piece of evidence is uh, directly attributable to my defendant. This proves the defendant was at the crime scene. Couldn't somebody say, well, wait a minute, how do I know? that that was really there 30 years ago. For all I know, you included this in the list of evidences 10 years after the fact. Somebody went to the property room, pulled out a bag, put that piece of evidence in the bag, put it back in the property room, and now I've got a bad piece of evidence in the case that was never there at the crime scene. So don't ask me to believe it's an important piece of evidence. Couldn't something similar have happened to the narrative about Jesus? Or oh, you've got some gospel that was written way back then. Well, maybe Jesus was much simpler back then. He was just a, a, a preaching rabbi, just somebody who's taught good moral truths. Uh, he never walked on water. He never rose from the grave. He wasn't born of a virgin. All of those details were added over the years until the simple story of Jesus of Nazareth became the miraculous story of the Christ of Christianity. How do I know that that story wasn't changed over time? Well, let's go back and talk about a principle we haven't yet discussed. It's one of those 10 uh, principles we introduced earlier. It's called the chain of custody. Well, if we have a crime scene from 30 years ago, we could simply ask, well, was there a detective or an officer at the scene 30 years ago who maybe saw that piece of evidence and photographed it with a Polaroid camera? Maybe he wrote a supplemental report in which he described it being at the scene. Well, that would help us, right? Because he's gonna give that piece of evidence to somebody if he checks it into property. They're gonna write a report and talks about how they received it. What did it look like? Where did it come from? Maybe he gives it to my dad who was back in those days working old cases. My dad was also a homicide detective. Maybe my dad got it from him and he took a Polaroid of his own or described in his report what that piece of evidence looked like. Then he brings it to the crime lab. They write a report. Then they bring it back out to our property room. Then they write a report. Then I pick it up from the property room and I write a report. Well, now I've got image after image after image, report after report after report, describing that piece of evidence over time, uh, linking it from the past to the present. And each person who describes that piece of evidence is like a link in a chain. And that's why we call this the chain of custody. And if you can demonstrate for a jury that you can show every link in the chain and how it hasn't changed link to link, you've got good reason to believe that your evidence hasn't been tampered with. Well, is there a New Testament chain of custody? Yeah, as a matter of fact, there is. Uh, for example, John, he writes a gospel. Well, okay, but how do you know the gospel of John you have in your Bible today is unaltered from the original gospel of John? Well, who were the next officers in the chain of custody he gave it to? He gave it to three of his students, three personal students of John who sat at his feet and listened to everything that John said about Jesus. Ignatius, Polycarp, Papias, these uh, students of John wrote down what John told them. Well, yeah, but how could we access, well, it turns out you're lucky, they became local leaders in the church, big leaders in the church, as a matter of fact, who wrote letters to local congregations. These letters still exist today. We can look at those letters to see what it is they're describing about Jesus, what it is that John told them about Jesus. There are seven letters that exist still from Ignatius, one from Polycarp, written to local congregations. We could check them, right? We could look and see, is Jesus simpler in those letters? He's not divine, right? I mean, he didn't, wasn't born of a virgin. Did he, did he rise from the grave? Are those elements there? Is all the divine nature of Jesus reported early by the people who were listening to John personally? And it turns out there's another link in the chain. Irenaeus is the student of Ignatius and Polycarp. You can look at his writing to see what he learned from his masters. Um, he had a student, Hippolytus. Hippolytus is the student of Irenaeus. You could look at Hippolytus to see what Irenaeus taught. You, you follow my, my, my thinking here. We've got a chain of custody. And we could go officer to officer, um, teacher to student, then teacher to student, then teacher to student, to see if the story of Jesus is changing over time. Do you realize by the time we get to Irenaeus, Irenaeus is actually listing 24 of the books of the New Testament that he is using with his student, Hippolytus? Don't let anyone tell you 
that the Gospels were cobbled together and the New Testament books were cobbled together at some uh, uh, council in the early church in the fourth century. No, in fact, they were being quoted immediately by the first students of the eyewitnesses. They were being listed hundreds of years before the church councils. The councils don't create the canon, they simply confirm the canon that's already in use already being quoted in the chain of custody. I've given in cold case Christianity three different chains of custody from John, from Paul, from Peter, in three entirely different regions of the empire, in Rome, in Asia Minor, in North Africa. Amazingly, the chain of custody shows the same thing over and over and over again. If you lost every canonical book we have today, every book of the Bible was lost, and all you had were the documents written by the first links in the chain right after the eyewitnesses, the story of Jesus was told early in history, repeated often, and it never changes. It stays the same over time. Now, I want to return for a second to something we talked about earlier in one of the earlier sessions. This claim made by skeptics, including Bart Ehrman, that says, hey, you can't trust uh, the God with the Gospels say because he found variations, single word usually, variations between the most ancient documents. Let's just do a little thought experiment for a second on that issue because we're really talking about whether or not things have been changed over time, and it appears that some of the documents as they go through history, there are small modifications, but we know, as I told you earlier, how to remove those modifications to get back to the truth. Okay, that being said, how do we know? Uh, let's do a thought experiment to determine if we can know the reliability of the Bible is actually uh, a certain. Imagine, if I removed, if you told me every place you found a variant, Every line of scripture in which you found a variant, it wouldn't be every line, it would be just every so often. What if I was to grant you that I will allow you to, for sake of argument only, to remove not only the variant, take the word out, but take out the entire line in which the variant existed? Take it out, just for sake of argument. No, do better than that. Let's take out every fourth line of scripture, just, just to make a case, okay? Let's just take out every fourth line. No, let's do better than that. Let, let's take out every other verse. So the skeptic who's making this claim, let's say, I'll tell you what, let's take out every other verse, you pick the even or the odd, we'll just take it out. Can't trust it, take it out. Let's do that now and take a look at what we have left. Do you think by taking out every other verse, and no skeptic thinks that it's this bad, that every other verse needs to be removed and can't be trusted, but even if you thought it was and you took it out, would you actually lose the narrative? Would you actually lose the truth claims of Christianity by taking out every other verse? Actually, you wouldn't. Here's why I say that. If you took out every other verse of the Gospels, take out some verses from John, take out verses from Luke and Mark and Matthew, well, whatever you took out of Luke, there's a good chance the parallel account in Mark or Matthew would reinsert the data that you just took out of Luke. These Gospels describe the same events. So there's a good chance whatever you take out of one Gospel, it's gonna come right back as reliable from the other Gospel. So much of the narrative you're gonna get back anyway. And then, if you took the early church fathers we just talked about, those early people in the chain of custody, and what they wrote about what they had learned from the eyewitnesses, and you just put that data back into the Gospels, you're never gonna get rid of the story of Jesus. You could take out half of the entire New Testament, and you'd still have more than enough reason to believe the claims of the, of the Gospels because they're either gonna be found back in again from the other accounts, the parallel accounts, or you've got enough data still in the account to know that it's true. So this whole idea that somehow identifying variants between manuscripts should cast doubt on what they say seems ridiculous, especially if I'm willing to grant you that you could take out every other verse and that won't even get rid of the Jesus story. You've got good reason to believe that the Jesus story has been recorded reliably, so you know enough to make a decision about the truth. And now we've taken a look at three aspects of reliability. Is it early enough? Can it be corroborated? And has it been transmitted to us over time reliably? Has the story changed? It hasn't. We're just one step away from finishing up our investigation about the reliability of the Gospels.